All right, so we talked about discrete random variables last time, and uh, discrete means there are gaps between the outcomes, right? And so those generally, those situations come from counting something. When we measure something, that, that'll usually result in a continuous random variable. And a continuous random variable means the outcomes can't just be listed because there are infinitely many and they are infinitely dense. So uh, it takes on all values in an interval of numbers and the probability distribution is described by a density curve. The probability of any event is the area under the density curve above the values of X that make up the event. All right, so we've already actually dealt with this way back when we were dealing with like normal CDF and normal distributions and finding areas under those. Um, so what I mean by measure, I'm gonna give you a couple examples. So of discrete versus continuous. And I think we've already kind of talked about this, but like age versus birthdays. Right, the number of birthdays you've had is discrete. So you guys are whatever, 16 or 17 or 18, right? That's the, but when you actually say that, you're talking about the number of birthdays you've had. That's a discrete uh, variable. True age is continuous. You're constantly aging, hurtling towards the grid. I'm just kidding. I, I don't mean to go dark there. All right, so another would be like shoe size. versus foot size. Shoe size is discrete. Right in America, we have whole and half sizes. And that's it. But your true foot size or a, per a randomly selected person's true foot size would be a continuous variable because it's not whatever 10 and a half, you could measure it. The, the more precise the the tool you had, the more precisely you could measure their true foot size, right? And so that could be anything on an interval from like, whatever, what's the smallest foot size? What's the smallest baby foot? Like two inches up to, let's say two feet or whatever. It could be any value on that interval, so it's continuous. All right. And so a continuous random variable Y has infinitely many possible values. All continuous probability models assign a probability zero to every individual outcome. Only intervals of values have a positive probability. So what that's saying for those of you who took calculus and those of you who didn't, but those of you who did would recognize this. Since we have you can't, there's no, you can't have a table that's a probability model like we could for a discrete random variable, right? Like for our discrete random variables, we're able to list the discrete outcomes and their corresponding probabilities. But for continuous, since there are infinitely many outcomes, you can't just list them out. So the only way we display it is as a density curve, right? So something like a normal distribution is a density curve. And so that would represent, whoa, whoa, that would represent our probability model. And so they're saying a single point on the X axis would represent one outcome. But because the area under the density curve represents the probability of that outcome, what's the area above a single point? Well, a single point has no thickness, right? It's infinitely thin. So its area is zero. So the probability of a single outcome for a continuous random variable is zero. And so to use my examples earlier, like what's the probability of a certain age? Well, if I go, what's the probability that you're exactly 16.105 years old right now? Well, it's gonna be zero because time has already passed. And even if you were at one point, 
you're a different age now, right? Or in shoe size, what's the probability that you're exactly a 10 and a half? That's also zero. And the reason being you could get a much more precise reading depending on the instrument that we used, right? If I had like an electron microscope, it's not going to be exactly 10 and a half. It's going to be 10.5. 0000001 or whatever it is. So any one outcome in a continuous random variable will have a probability of zero. You can only find a probability of an interval of outcomes that would have an actual positive result. Okay. All right. And that's something we've actually done before. So we've used as long as if you know that it's normal, so like, um, just a quick example, you don't have to write this down. The, the, the heights of young women closely follow a normal distribution with a mean of 64 inches and a standard deviation of 2.7 inches. What's the probability that a woman is between 68 and 70 inches tall? So then we could just use normal CDF. Right, we would have mean 64, standard deviation 2.7. Um, and I just put the boundaries as between 68 and 70. And whatever that value comes out to would be our probability. Let's real quick just go over how to do that. We'll use these numbers. So it's been a while since we've used our calculators to do something like this. You can see if you go to distributions, which is just above the variables button right next to clear, we go second variables. Normal CDF is the second option. In this case, I would want my lower boundary to be 68, my upper boundary to be 70, my mean was 64, right? Yes, 64, and my standard deviation was 2.7. If you have an older version of the calculator, it won't give you this menu. I'll show you what it will. You'll just enter it like this. <clears throat> so remember the comma is right here above the seven. And you would just do normal CDF 68 comma 70 and then comma mean standard deviation. So 64 comma 2.7. There we go. So about a 5.6% chance. All right. <clears throat> if we were doing this by hand, we would first want to find the corresponding z scores to 68 and 70 which remember z score is your value minus the mean divided by the standard deviation so the z scores would be 1.48 and 2.22 corresponding and then we could look it up in our table of areas you won't have to do that you can just use your calculator but Okay, so this is referencing what we were just talking about, that the probability of any single given outcome is exactly zero. So what's the difference between the probability is strictly less than A and the probability is less than or equal to A? <clears throat> the answer is there is no difference. Okay, as long as it's a continuous random variable, those will be the exact same because the only difference is that in this one you would be including a which is one single outcome and the probability of one single outcome occurring is zero so it's not going to change the overall probability just to make the inequality inclusive of a <clears throat> All right, so we'll just finish up <clears throat> with a quick example of continuous random variables. 
The weights of three-year-old females closely follows a normal distribution with a mean of 30.7 pounds and a standard deviation of 3.6 pounds. Randomly choose one three-year-old female and call her weight X. Find the probability that the randomly selected three-year-old weighs at least 30 pounds. All right. Whenever I do something like this, I like to kind of sketch it out so that I know what I'm looking at. So this is my random variable X, which is weight. They told us it follows a normal distribution with a mean of 30.7. And we had this standard deviation, which remember you can eyeball by, it's the distance from the center to the inflection point on the curve, meaning where it changes concavity. And they tell us the standard deviation is 3.6. Okay. And we want the probability that a randomly selected three-year-old female weighs at least 30 pounds. So at least means greater than or equal to. So probability that X is greater than or equal to 30. All right. So 30 is gonna be like somewhere over here, right? Just to the left of 30.7. And I'm basically looking for all of this area. So it's okay to use your calculator. Just remember you would need to notate um, exactly what the syntax is. So you go normal, C, D, F. You also can't just give what the calculator inputs are. You have to label what the inputs would be. So remember lower. So the lower bound is gonna be 30 comma upper. The upper bound is technically infinite. Now there's no infinity button on your calculator, so we'll just throw a bunch of nines in there. The mean, 30.7, and the standard deviation of 3.6. Okay. So what did I say? 30. No, 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 no. Mean is 30.7. The standard deviation is 3.6. All right, so we get about 0.577 or 57.7%. All right, find the probability that a randomly selected three-year-old female weighs between 25 and 35 pounds. So we would notate that as probability that X is in between 25 and 35. So same syntax, we're still gonna use that normal CDF. It's just that our lower and upper bounds will change. So my lower bound will now be 25. My upper bound will be 35. My mean still 30.7 and my standard deviation is 3.6. So really all I have to change is that lower and upper bound. So that's gonna be 25. My upper bound is 35. And I'll just delete all these nines. All right, so about 82.7% for that.
Okay, so now we're given that P of X is less than K is 0.8, and they want us to find the value of K. So again, I'm just going to sketch that situation out. There's my distribution. My mean is 30.7. My standard deviation is 3.6. This is X, which is weight in pounds. And then they tell us that there's some value of X such that if X, some value K, such that if X is less than K, we would get back a probability of 0.8 or 80%. So first, I know that that has to be to the right of the mean, right? Because here, that area is exactly 50%. So I know my value of K is somewhere to the right of that. Let's say it's right here. Then I know that all this red area, right, is 0.8. All right, so the function that we want to use in our calculator for this is inverse norm, right? We're using it in the inverse way we had been. Remember, the syntax for inverse norm, we've used this before, is you input the area, which is 0.8, and you can give it the mean and the standard deviation of your distribution. And what it will spit back is this value, this value K that bounds that area, okay? Which is exactly what we want. And so the answer it'll give us will be the weight in pounds that is at the 80th percentile of female three-year-old weights. You can find that function, remember, in the same place we found normal CDF. So it's the third option down, inverse norm. The area is 0.8. Now, if you just leave the mean as 0 and the standard deviation as 1, it's going to give you the z-score. And then you could use the z-score formula to by hand convert it back uh, to an, an actual data value. But Again, we don't need to do that. We can just tell it that the mean is 30.7 and the standard deviation is 3.6 and it'll do that algebra for us. It'll just calculate exactly what the weight is at the 80th percentile, which is 33.7 pounds. Just make sure you kind of do a check for sanity here. Make sure that answer makes sense in the context, so I said 33.7 pounds. And let's just look at, yeah, that makes sense that that would be right here to the right of 30.7 pounds. All right.